the major anti-arguments, interesting question, I would say are, first of all, governments can't keep secrets. If Nixon couldn't keep Watergate secret, how could the government keep something as big as this secret for all this time? Secondly, we have no evidence that it is possible to go between the stars. Most reputable astronomers would say it's impossible. I mean, the fastest craft we have it would take 70,000 years to get to the next nearest star. Mm -hmm. You're talking about people coming willy-nilly across the galaxy, if you will. Um, I would say, look, most people are really poor witnesses. Uh, don't you think that's true? I mean, you know, how precise can you be? You're struck with something suddenly. You're not prepared to make careful observation. Isn't it true that most sightings don't last very long? Uh, how much can we count on witness testimony? <coughs> I would probably say, why is it if all these people were abducted, nobody brought back any souvenirs? People are inveterate. You know, whether it's towels at hotels or ashtrays or packs of matches or whatever. All those war veterans brought back German bayonets and German daggers and all kinds of stuff, and Japanese swords. Uh, the world is full of these souvenirs. So where's a souvenir from a spacecraft? Mm -hmm. I would say, do you really believe that the government threatened death to people if they would talk about something like this? I find that awful. Governments don't do that, not peaceful democracies. Those are probably the kinds of arguments that I would make, that in the absence of really good film, top-notch testimony, you know, why is it that there aren't more scientists who see these things? They're interested in the sky. Now, all these arguments sound good, none of them stand up. And I've already thought of those arguments before I make my presentation. I do get asked, strangely enough, what arguments would you make to a bunch of skeptics? And I tell people I don't aim my lecture at skeptics. That is, people have already made up their mind, don't bother me with the facts my mind's made up. I aim my lecture at the healthy agnostics, the 80% in between, who say, well, you've got a good background, I don't know have strong feelings one way or another, let me hear what you've got to say. And that's how I designed my whole lecture, is to bring forth the negative arguments. When I deal with Blue Book Special Report 14, I show the data in stages. Uh, here's 20% unknowns, but I've already told people that they did a quality evaluation of all those sightings. How do we know that those unknowns aren't just the three-second observations at four in the morning by the town drunks of the world? Here's the quality evaluation, mm -hmm. which shows that that isn't so. But it's the data that carries the ball, not my saying that's not true. That isn't good enough. Uh, and I also am good at looking at things from a sense of perspective. A lot of straw man arguments put up by the noisy negativists. Look how much energy it would take to go to the next galaxy. And I make a very strong point in my lecture. I don't care about other galaxies. I don't care about our own galaxy, the Milky Way, 80,000 light years across, a big flattened spiral pancake, and we're 28,000 light years from the middle of this galaxy, you know, the moon docks, if you will. I care about the local neighborhood. Within 54 light years of here, there are 1,000 stars. 46 of those stars are very similar to the sun and might be expected to have planets in life, not too old, not too new, not too hot, not too cold, that sort of thing. Two of those stars, at least, are a billion years older than the sun. So I don't care about what's out there, I care about the local neighborhood. If my wife asks me to get a loaf of bread for dinner, I'm certainly not going to say, well, hey, that great bakery in Sydney, Australia, I can't possibly get there and back in time for dinner. She said, hey, the store's down the street a mile. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter, Sydney, Australia. Yeah, the bread's good, you've told me, but... So that's one of many of these phony baloney arguments, strawman arguments. The next galaxy, incidentally, is a million light years away. Who cares? Why should I worry about that? If my car gets stolen in Fredericton, New Brunswick, 
you could say, well, let's see now, there's six billion earthlings now, so the chance of finding whoever stole it is practically nil, because one in six billion, it could have been any of those people. You say, hey, Stan, in the first place, most of them can't drive. In the second place, isn't it much more likely to be somebody who lives in New Brunswick <coughs> or within a hundred miles of where you live, that just cut the odds down. Fewer than a million people as opposed to six billion. So you have to focus on, on what's relevant. And that's what I try to do with people. And most of these arguments, people are poor observers. What well, sounds good, it is true that people aren't skilled observers. Most of them, of course, there are plenty of sightings by skilled observers, airline pilots. Our life depends on them being decent observants. If there's another plane coming at it, you don't want them to, oh well, who cares? You want them to do something about it. But the reason, you can't have it both ways, you see. The reason we can identify most things as relatively conventional phenomena seen under unconventional circumstances is that people are good observers, they're poor interpreters. We know it was Venus because what the guy described, what direction he was looking at the time, how bright it was relative to other things, the fact that it wasn't blinking. I go to the book and I say, gee, that was Venus. And if it wasn't, where the heck was Venus at that time? You know, we can identify most things because the observations are good. Now, what happens often is that reporters and some UFO investigators, unfortunately, will put words in the mouth of the witness. Well, how big was it? Gee, I don't know. There's no way to judge. Well, size of a Volkswagen? Well, it might have been. How far away was it? Well, there was no way to judge. It was in the sky. Well, half mile away? Yeah, it could have been. And you go on like this, how high was it, and so forth. Next day's newspaper says, witness says, Volkswagen-sized UFO is seen half a mile away and 300 yards up. And the scientist says, well, that's nonsense. You can't judge any of those things. Well, you've got to ask him, what angle was it above the horizon? What was its angular size? What can you hold at arm's length that will just cover it? You've got to do the other proper investigation techniques. Now, admittedly, I asked the cop one time, RCMP actually, I said, look, it's a high profile crime and you ask the public for any help they give you. You get a response? Oh yeah, hundreds of calls. What percentage of them are useful? Oh, two or three percent, but that's how we solve most crimes. Mm -hmm. So you've got to put up with some noise to get to the signal. And we do that in every field, not just nuclear fission or antibiotic development, but in everything else. There are a lot of materials out there. Aren't many that are useful in high performance turbines, for example. And so science is supposed to be focused on what's relevant. 